Yeah. Um, there's. Uh, do you want? Do you want like a mobile water or? Yeah, it's just okay. So the restroom is right over here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you have that or should I ask? I think I have an email from her some time ago, so let me see. Hey, I'm Brian Keating. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Good. Thank you. How long are you here for? This uh, evening. Okay. Do you have a schedule for this afternoon? I uh, don't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Should I talk about this? Good. Thank you. 
Okay. He's still he's still interested and wants to have some involvement. So, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, they, they went for it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. 
Hello. I feel a little awkward introducing the speaker because I don't know many of you. You probably don't know me. So I, I'm John McGregor. <laughs> I work in the business department. Um, and uh, so thank you to the people who live in this building for hosting our seminar. Um, uh, our speaker is Mustafa Amin, who um, I've known for a long time. Uh, he's a postdoc at Cambridge, and maybe he'll yeah, we'll figure out who he is from what he says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. Uh, Mustafa, before you start, I just want to make uh, an announcement, actually. So I just come from the uh, UCLA Dark Matter meeting yesterday. It was a rather, rather momentous day, I think. Uh, so essentially, the Fermi Lab group uh, and Dan Cooper, with, as far as I can tell, the ascent of the Fermi collaboration, have a pretty good signal for uh, dark matter annihilation in the Galactic Center. This looks, I, no one can see anything wrong with this. And uh, you know, the, the bugaboo with this in the past has been millisecond pulsar backgrounds in the Viking Center. The signal's been known for a long time. But the new wrinkle is that they actually have enough statistics, I think, they can go up into the halo. And they still see this as completely consistent with like an NFW profile for dark matter. So I'll just say that. Uh, yeah, both of them. Here it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we just go and talk about it. Okay. <laughs> now I'm about this. Uh, okay. So what I'm going to be talking about today is something about the very early universe. This is, um, as the title somewhat quick bit suggests, it is what happens in the universe right after inflation. I'll tell you about inflation and stuff like that as we go along. So before I tell you about inflation and so on, I want to start with a movie. 
And the reason for this is that I want you to sort of hopefully, it will raise some questions when I play this movie, in fact, a couple of them, and that I will answer questions about this movie as we go through the talk. But feel free to ask me any questions at any time. So what you're seeing here in this movie, it's a very simple movie. On this axis right here is a amplitude of the scalar field. On the horizontal axis is space. So the green line just represents an almost homogeneous field. Right? So this is in one plus one dimension. And the equation governing this field is just the Klein-Gordon equation, a potential that's nonlinear. So the potentials, the V shape, is something like this. Because it's not exactly quadratic, but it opens up a way. And on top of that, it hides it in the equation, but the universe, I'm allowing for the universe to expand here. But it's a single scalar field, almost homogeneous, and I'm going to let it go and see what happens. If you've dealt with scalar fields, simple scalar fields, this should seem quite odd. Usual normal scalar fields, they would have just kept on oscillating. And if there are fluctuations, they would have kept on fluctuation. And in an expanding universe, this fluctuation would have damped away. They would have been stretched out and lived at This is something quite different. The field starts oscillating. There seems to be an instability. And then it goes into these localized structures. Yes? How does the um, frame rate of your movie compare to the uh, so, if you saw these guys oscillating, so this frequency, the frame rate is such that you are capturing the whole oscillation. But is it, I mean, uh, if I look at V double prime at the bottom. Uh -huh. Right, so V double prime at the bottom is the rate at which that these things easy. oscillate. So it's, it is a typical mass. Okay, so this is a picture in the field space. Okay, now let's see what it looks like in just in terms of density. Okay, so, one more question. Yes. The amplitude that you're studying compares how to the So it's somewhere yeah. Okay. So it sees the it sees the nonlinear. It's not right at the bottom. Um, here this is the same picture again, same evolution, but I'm just going to plot the density as a function of space and see what this looks like. The previous picture was in field, and here is it in density. So again, quite an interesting behavior that you have these ooh, pizzas here. <laughs> As the universe evolves, the density goes down just like in a normal universe. And however, there's localized structure formation here. Just because of the field, there's no local gravity that's attracting things. It's just an expanding universe. And these spiky structures form, and they stay there. If you notice, these spiky structures seem to have become narrow. It's not that they're becoming narrow. They're actually maintaining the size. It's just the universe is expanding. Okay. So there are fixed objects with fixed, fixed physical size that form, and they remain. And the space, so what governs the scale of the space? Ah, very good question. So I will talk about this a little bit when we get to the talk. But the spacing is essentially governed by the wave number of the node that grows the fastest first. So there's an instability. Essentially, if you count the number of peaks, that will tell you how many of these guys there are. And it's amazing, by the way, that just a simple estimate gets you within a factor of two of the number density of these objects. OK, so hopefully this raises some Yes? I'm sorry, I think this is really the John question. Huh? But you just chose the initial condition such that it wasn't at the bottom of the potential. Yes. So. And there's a good, I mean, there's a, the initial conditions that are natural for inflation will actually start in the further away. I and mean, naturally, you're going to start somewhere at the top. You're not going to start at the bottom. OK, so hopefully this raises some questions, but this is all in one plus one dimension. Let me show you the exact same movie, but now in three dimensions. So this is, again, the same movie. Now I'm drawing a surface at a given overdensity. And you see the same blobby structures forming. And they form. And you'll see them shrinking in size slightly, but this is not a very long movie in terms of the Hubble time at that point. So you don't see it shrinking too much. But you see these blobby structures forming. They, they form, they persist. So my talk was about inflation, so I will have to answer to the talk. What does this movie or these movies have to do with the end of inflation? And what are these lumps? 
I'm going to talk about this in the context of inflation, but I could have done this for many other cases as well. <laughs> and John was concentrating on this point right here. This is just I forgot to remove that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's the synopsis of my talk. Uh, I'll talk about end of inflation of some simple scenarios. I will talk about the fragmentation of the inflaton field into these lumps. I will give you some details of what these lumps are. They're called oscillons. I will talk about solutions, stability, their interactions. Then I will take a digression because I want to tell you about some other work I'm doing. It's kind of related to this, but you know, I just want to advertise it, so I'll say it. talk about it, and then I'll end some of you. Yes. Astronomers here who are in particle <laughs> physics, are these oscillons and all that, are they re real things, or is this just a theoretical expression of things? I mean, if this is the model and this is what happened in the universe, then they're real, but I don't know if this exactly happened in the universe. We haven't detected them. So these are not the, the bumps and wiggles that are in the W map? No, no, that. these are not, and I will talk about this. These are on much smaller scales than what you see in W. You should, in fact, in today's, they don't exist all the way till today. They go away eventually. Uh, but these things are much smaller than any scales you see in the sky. Today. Are you going to tell us how they figure into reheating? That's part of the. Yes. Should we try to bring Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have couplings to other fields, which can take energy away from them, and if that coupling is strong compared to a subcoupling, then you will, of course, do more. Okay. And there's no reason, there's no conserved charge here. Okay, so it's, it's dynamically, these things are stable, but they can leak away energy. And we are taking a break for pizza. Okay, so quick, quick break. <laughs> uh, make sure you sign in if you take some pizza. Are you wet or not? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You don't have to so you don't see the red dash into each other. So I've tried doing the same simulation without expansion. Right? Sure, why not? Why not? And it ends up just sort of. I mean, yeah, yeah. or, well, for not expanding days. So people have been like, this. I don't know if they talk about this a lot. I don't know if they talk about this a lot. This is not good. Yes. Yeah, so oh, yes. Yeah, so this is a nature paper. But just like what I've shown. They exist. They're not They're not They're localized. They just stay where they are. And we have to prove that the all 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 the this is different. As I said, what's different here is that they value up statistics that they can look, uh, they can see the signal. The emissivity drops, uh, you know, consistent with like an NFW profile. Yeah, it's like actually. Yeah, it's like so the problem with what you saw from Pink Iron so, before was a big signal that's been known for years, two years or so. But the problem was that um, there were all kinds of backgrounds. Yes. You had 500 you know, millisecond pulsars in the you know, bulge area across the center, and that, that would easily explain the signal. The point is, those pulsars should drop off. Yeah. On the grid, we don't really know if it's true. Um, but the claim is that Fermi would see them if they did. They don't see that. 
So this smells like dark matter. No one can see it being small. Well, there's two different papers. Well, there's two different papers that have the same line in it. Okay. Well, really, it's like they did something. What is the line? So it's consistent. You know, you don't get a line for this. So you don't even know the page. This is all this is all unnecessary. Right? So it's consistent if they, if they just look at the BB bar of the page, then, um, you know, just look at that. Like, right, this is a much more characteristic of what you shower and the Then this would be consistent with the 32 in the in the annihilation. in the second in annihilation of it. It's a shallow cone. You see the electromagnetic cascade. It's one of the channels for the entire It's one of the few things that actually power sort so that is but they can also measure the old Amanda all that stuff. No, no, I haven't read that. I think so. I've been looking at the other ones where it's a three and a half and that they see, and that maybe is the sterile. No, it's different. As George says, once you've seen one, you've seen lots of things. <laughs> or dark matter particles. <laughs> so we see it in the walls. The ball consists of the Somebody's Okay, so <coughs> this is the synopsis. I'm going to continue on because you guys enjoy the pizza. So let me sort of give a big picture of this, uh, of what's going on. So this is you know, sort of the biggest picture I can construct. This is the history of the universe. You know, cartoon version on the horizontal axis is time, temperature, energy. Pick your, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with. This is where we are today. And this is at the beginning. There's inflections right there. And here you have the cosmic microwave background about 300,000 years after some initial time. The reason there is a white space in between inflation and about a minute or so after the Big Bang is because we really don't know what is going on at that time. It's kind of funny because we know what, or we kind of have some idea of what goes on at the very early stage because of the fluctuation of the cosmic microwave background. This is effect because the universe was accelerating at that time. This allows you to imprint what was happening at that time on very large scales. However, after the universe start, ac start accelerating, we really we don't have a good clue of what's going on in the middle. 
And this is a huge range of energy scales. Enormous range of energy scales. In the version of this figure, you got, they, they did have something there. Yes. <laughs> 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 they had lots of things there, of course they did. <laughs> So if you push it back, right, Viola, of course we know more than just that. I mean, we have particle accelerators, we believe that it's not too different in the other universe. And you could push it back quite a bit, but still, I mean, there's a huge range of energy scales where we don't know what is going on. Okay. And this is an interesting time because lots of things that we don't understand, maybe matter antimic, matter asymmetry and such, could be created in this sense. So it's an interesting period. I'm not going to talk about everything that happens there. I just want to concentrate on this boundary at the end of inflation and rest of the world okay, of what happens at the end of, at, at, at end of inflation. So a very naive question you could ask is, what does the universe look like at that time? Is it relatively homogeneous on subhorizon scales? Is it turbulent and messy? Is it lumpy? So let me just remind you a little bit about the simplest ways in which inflation works. You have a almost homogeneous scalar field. If that scalar field is rolling slowly, that is, kinetic energy is small compared to its potential energy, then its pressure is significantly negative. And just like the cosmological constant today drives accelerated expansion, in a similar way, this scalar field will drive accelerated expansion during inflation as long as the field is rolling slowly. That gives you accelerated expansion. That gives you inflation. But what you really is important about this period is also that if you calculate the quantum fluctuations, the zero quantum fluctuations in the field at that time, the characteristics of those fluctuations after some processing gives exactly the kind of fluctuation that we see in the cosmic microwave background. So these are just all, you know, if you write down the equation of motion for the fluctuations of the scalar field in Fourier space, it looks like a harmonic oscillator. If you write down the ground state for this harmonic oscillator for each mode, you get the typical amplitude of the fluctuations from there. The spectrum is also almost right, and you just turn the crank and you get what you see in the CMP. Okay, so it's, it's really elegant in that sense. So this is all nice and good. This is what inflation does for you. But if you we are interested in what happens at the end of inflation, so how do you end inflation? Inflation happened because the field rolled slowly, so if you want to end inflation, make it roll fast. Okay? Then the kinetic and potential energies become comparable you no longer have significant negative pressure, and inflation stops. So a simple way of doing that is just give the potential a minimum, and the field will stop oscillating. And this will stop the universe from expanding at an accelerated point. The details of what happens at time, of course, depends on the shape of this potential, okay, or the self-interactions of this field, as well as how it interacts with the rest of the other fields. For example, you could write down an inflaton potential which is just quadratic, and then couple it to some fermions, like so. And we can have a very slow decay from the inflaton to these fermions. So you're just siphoning away energy slowly from the inflaton field. So the field not only damps because the universe is expanding, but also because it's slowly siphoning away energy. In this case, if you started out with the universe on Hubble scales at that time being relatively homogeneous, which it should be at the end of inflation, at least approximately, then nothing changes. It just remains homogeneous, and you keep on oscillating. And eventually, you will reheat the universe, and so on. The reheating will happen when the decay rate becomes comparable to the Hubble rate. Okay, that's the characteristic time scale that you want to compare. That's, however, this was sort of the picture that people had in mind till the early 90s. This changes dramatically, actually, when you do a careful calculation. For example, if you just add, is there a laser pointer? Mm -hmm. So if you add a term just like this, okay, so here is the inflaton field, it's an m squared phi squared potential that drives inflation, and this is the coupling. So phi is inflaton, chi is some daughter field, just standing for, so let's say it's a scalar field for the moment, and that's what I'll be using, simplicity. What happens? What happens to this other field? Do you still slowly siphon away the energy? It turns out that the answer, as worked out by a number of people, in particular Kaufman, Linde, and Sarabinsky, there should be no edge out there. Uh, Sorry, you, you're making a certain case where the thing's coupled to its fermions and then it's coupled? No, it's just. Um, or just the coupling is. This the coupling is. Uh, the fermions, it's important because fermions, you can't populate the modes because of Fermi exclusion. Here are their bosons that help significantly. And also, the, I think for, for the moment, yeah, that is a key difference between the two. Okay. 
No, I mean, of course, it's reporting from the system. Tell them how to get associated with it. But that's not the key point. It's the fact that one is for one is for um, what is So what happens in this case? So before I go on, just notice that when you write down the equation of motion for the sphere, just write it down, you will find that the infoton acts as a mass. It's, and if the field is oscillating, it acts as a time-dependent mass. So let's just sh let me just show you a movie of what happens. Again, what you see, what you will see here, is a surface drawn at some multiple of the average density. So if things fragment, you will see surfaces appear. If things don't fragment, you just you should not see anything. So here is what happens in this case. So the field starts oscillating. So this is just a cartoon. This is actually what's going on. And you see that very quickly, within a couple of oscillations, the field fragments. What's really going on is that the infoton very quickly dumps energy into the daughter field. The daughter field back reacts on the, infot on the infoton. It becomes a, a mess very, very quickly. Let me just give you a slightly more visual version of this. Okay? So here is a slice through the three-dimensional space. So this is the infoton field at some value in other three units here. Uh, it's going to start oscillating. And notice that every time the field goes to zero, you will see lots of fluctuation appear. So the amplitude of fluctuation should think of as number of particles being created in the chi field. So you notice that as the field oscillates, you populate this part. The, the equations, if you write them down, as I showed previously, are actually identical to the equations you would write down for a child in a school. As the child stands up and down, you change the length of the pendulum periodically. Here, the length of the pen the role of the length of the pendulum is played by the infoton field, which is oscillating. And the arc of the swing would be the number of daughter particles produced. So that increases rapidly if you stand up and down. This phenomenon is called parametric resonance. Another way of thinking about this, this is not completely accurate either, is that every time the infoton goes to zero, the chi field thinks its mass is zero and you can produce it rapidly. But really what's going on is that you're changing the frequency non-idiomatically. So you're changing the frequency very rapidly in that period. So the frequency goes. is high compared to the expansion rate? The frequency is high. However, this is all the picture that I showed was for sort of like a bowl-like potential, okay? not much nonlinearity. It was coupled to some other fields. But if you look at observations today, they actually disfavor potentials that are too steep. Lambda phi to the fourth is here. This is m squared phi squared. They prefer potentials that flatten out in the region where inflation is taking place. So this is for Planck. And this <coughs> nice little spot is Sarovinsky inflation, where this becomes completely flat, or just looks flat. And this also changes, actually. Instead of 1 over n, it becomes 12 over n squared. It's an actual change in the practice. And these kinds of potentials, I mean, observations, of course, uh, have told us that you need something flatter. But also, lots of theoretical work has been done on this. And generically, the form of the potential is you have some curvature at the minimum. Then you have some scale where the potential changes shape. And then some power law to it. Yeah. So this is a general shape of all of these works that, that show that the potential flattens out. So what happens in this case? So what happens to the dynamics of the infoton in this case? So I'm going to consider a simpler case where I'm going to ignore couplings to other fields. In other words, the couplings to other fields are small compared to the subcoupling. That's the assumption that you Even the simple scenario, <laughs> you find that this time something rather different happens. The infoton neither just slowly decays away because of expansion, nor does it fragment and become a turbulent mess. It actually fragments rapidly, just as before, but now it goes into these blobby structures. So this is where I'm making the connection to the first movies I showed, that the infoton field, if it's governed by a potential which required by observations as well as simple theoretical motivation, the potential opens up away from the minimum. In that case, it seems the infoton by itself, at the end of inflation, will be unstable. It will fragment. It will fragment into and go into such blobby structures. Yes? Is, is the wave number where this happens? Times two equal to the square root of k squared plus f squared. Sorry, the. Never mind. I've heard the guess. Okay. <laughs> uh, the next 
few slides will answer the question of what is a typical wave number, right? uh, where, where these kinds of things happen. To quickly answer your question, by the way, these objects are wide compared. The size is wide compared to n inverse. So they're not n inverse size objects. They're wide. They're 10, 20 times n inverse. However, the wave number that gets excited is also somewhat smaller than uh, n inverse. It's a factor of 5. I'll show the file. OK. So this is the new thing that I've been sort of thinking about uh, quite a bit. Of course, I told you this is a nice story that the observations came in. We got motivated to study these potentials. That was not the way it happened. I was really studying these objects by themselves because I was fascinated by something that holds its shape okay, and then realized that, oh, this is cool. This can be applied to inflation. But this is a nice story. Uh, OK, so this is rather nice that at the end of inflation, you can have these structures form. And this is not something that has been appreciated before. People thought you either went to a turbulent mess or you know, the university remained homogeneous. This is, this is fun and new. So now let me say a, little, a few more words about the conditions of these guys emerging and so on. So far, all the movies that I've shown you start with a relatively homogeneous state. This that starts oscillating, and you get these structures. You might worry that maybe that I had put something special in the initial conditions, right, in the initial spectrum that gave rise to these objects. To convince you otherwise, here is the initial configuration of the field. This was work actually originally done by Eddie Farhi at MIT in small plus one dimensions. They, had a, they were not thinking at the end of inflation at all. They were thinking of some completely different. And again, you see the exact behavior, same behavior as you saw before. So hopefully this convinces you that there was nothing special in the initial conditions that you brought to this. But of course, you know, here in this field, as well as the fact that these are nonlinear objects, it does make you wonder that you need to go from tiny fluctuations to big ones. So how do you do that? Okay, how does this actually happen? And the answer to that question is self-resonance. By that I mean that the homogeneous oscillations pumps energy into the non-zero modes very efficiently. And it does so through, so through parametric resonance. To be sure, for parametric resonance is really it's a or Floquet analysis, the theory gets developed about oscillations without expansion, it's about periodic systems and so on. But in an expanding universe, these things can still be efficient provided that your growth rate of fluctuations, okay, the speed at which things grow, is high compared to the Hubble rate. Otherwise, you're just going to stretch things out. So you can do the calculation in flat space. You can compare it to the Hubble expansion rate and see whether it's efficient or not. For people who haven't seen, um, I haven't seen this before. I started working on this you know, parametric resonance before. Here's a quick primer. So here is a something that looks just like a harmonic oscillator. I think the fluctuation in the field in Fourier space, k squared is a wave number. U double prime is a mass term. If this is constant, that is, you've just got a quadratic potential, then this is just a harmonic oscillator. It's just going to keep on oscillating. However, if there are nonlinear parts of it, then there will be some phi dependence here. And if the field is oscillating, it looks like a periodically changing mass. Remember the child on the swing. In that case, Floquet theory says that you will have solutions that will grow exponentially okay, in for certain wave numbers. You can do the analysis carefully. And for example, you'll have these beautiful plots that you can generate. On the vertical axis is the amplitude with which the background field is oscillating. On the horizontal axis right here is a wave number. The light regions are regions where you have the instability. So if the background field is oscillating at this amplitude and you're at this wave number, you will grow exponentially fast. If you are here, you will not grow exponentially fast. Okay? There are certain wave numbers which will get preferred. It's not like every wave number will grow. Okay. So John, to answer your question, this plot will tell you. So you have to do this analysis to see where things are. But I think your intuition about the, you know, square, the square root of k squared by lambda, that applies to these bands, the higher, higher bands, but not to the zero band. So that's, that's the interesting part where things really cool. OK, so this is. In an expanding universe, you don't sit somewhere. You actually have trajectories that go through this. So you actually you know, sample different parts of these bands and so on. So it's a little bit more complicated. But you, as you can imagine, the real thing you have, want to compare is these Floquet exponents. That's what these are called, the rate at which these grow, compared to the Hubble expansion rate. 
But these kinds of potentials, I've chosen a specific form, but the maximum value of this ratio is actually just determined by the ratio of m Planck over m, where m is a scale where the potential changes shape. There's a weak dependence on alpha, because, you know, it's an order one number. But this ratio, m Planck over m, is what determines whether this ratio is large. To get some intuition about why m Planck comes in, it comes in because you have a Hubble parameter. That's where the m Planck is. So this then gives you a good way of knowing whether, at the end of inflation, if you write down a potential, and if you just characterize it with some scale where it changes shape, if this ratio is large compared to 1, then you will have this phenomena taking place. If it's not, then it's unlikely that this will be efficient. Just a comment, if you saw in the WMAP parts, or if you're following the literature, the, the Starobinsky model, which is smack in the middle of you know, the confidence contours, that actually has this ratio just about 1. So there, this would not be efficient. But other models that people have been so quite consistent do have this behavior. <coughs> so let me talk a little bit about the implications of, of what's going on. One thing you might want is if you want something fun to happen because of this fragmentation and these blobs forming, you want them to hope maybe dominate the energy density of the universe, at least at that time. Then you have some, at least it would be good because it could do something. We do find that for a large range of parameters, that is the slope alpha of the potential as well, or the power of the potential as well as the Planck over m, you get a large region where the fraction of energy density in oscillons is large, is of order unity. And so most of the energy does get locked up in these blocks. That's quite cool. And by the way, it's nice because a linear analysis gives you, whenever this ratio is of order 10, that's this curve right here, it tells you that if the growth rate is large compared to Hubble rate, then you're almost guaranteed to get this behavior. Again, this is under the assumption that couplings to other fields are weak. So if the oscillons are effectively spatially discrete. That's right. Then if we're still inflating, okay. if, you know, then the number density of those things is going down. Yes. Right? Okay. But this is at the end of inflation, so you're you've, already, you've already tunneled through and you you've done your slow roll. Right. right. This is okay. Okay. exactly. This is all at the end of inflation, so you're no longer inflating, so you can't completely wipe them out because of the initial expansion. <clears throat> so this, I mean, if you want, this just looks like rocks sitting at that time. So they decay. The, the density goes away as matter, normal matter. That's the one away you keep. But their density perturbations. Yeah, their density perturbations. But on small scales. OK, so this is nice. The energy fraction is large. What can we do with this fact? Um, so this is so. I don't have a signature I can tell you, let's go and look for this in the sky. Okay. But I can tell you the things I'm thinking about. One is, as the, you have raised the question, does this, what does this do to reheating? One thing that could happen is potentially it could delay reheating. Okay. So there could be a long phase where these lock up the energy for a while and then release it later. So that's one possibility. But there's no nothing I can think of that directly probes that. What it does, what that would do is it would change the expansion history of the universe for a period because we have mass domination for a while. So it has an indirect effect on the expansion history, which so if you're in, trying to interpret observables about inflation, then that changes a little bit. But I can't see a direct probe of that. I've also thought a little bit, and this would be fantastic if it actually happened. I wanted to think about whether these blobs collapse to form primordial block holes. They're pretty high density, a factor of hundreds or so higher than the background. And that would be fun, but I haven't been able to convince myself that this happens with any efficiency. So I calculate the gravitational potential around these objects. Okay? I didn't do a full gravitational simulation, but I just post-processed my simulation and asked the question, what's the gravitational potential around them? And I get around values of phi over c squared of 10 to the minus 2 at these most. Are, these are nonlinear fluctuations. Yeah, these, understand you, right? So sorry, the collapse yeah. time should be a order of you know, bubble time at any point. Right, exactly. Okay. But no, I'm talking about individual objects yes. collapsing. They are not determined the collapse for them. It's not different by gravity. Okay. They have self interaction. Okay, doesn't that depend on the scale of your input potential? Because there's some mass scale in there. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So it if does. you made it near Planck scale, these things will turn into Planck. Right, if it was near Planck scale, but I'm assuming we have already some constraints in the inflation. I'm using a model that's consistent with observations of what the mass scale should be and so on. Um, and in that case, I find it difficult right now, but it would be cool because you know you could take the input on, maybe dump all this energy into these guys, these would decay away by Hawking, yeah, and then you would have you know, a radiation-filled universe through this 
uh, to this mechanism. But of course, it's a pipe dream. I mean, we haven't shown anything that something like this can happen. But it would be fun to do it more carefully. I already talked, sorry, a little bit about the expansion <coughs> history. You also, gen because of this fragmentation process, you also generate gravitational waves. Um, again, I'll talk a little bit about the next slide. And so, and the number of these objects from one Hubble flash to the other will vary. That seems like a number density fluctuation. It's a density fluctuation, and so on. So that's another thing we could think about. In terms of gravitational waves, this is not an actual calculation. This is just a cartoon. Uh, so here are some, you know, this is the fraction of energy density in gravitational waves. This frequency, it's I almost feel embarrassed to show plots where the, you know, the range is 28 orders of magnitude. Um, and the red regions are regions that have been ruled out or that have already been constrained by observations. Uh, these have changed in the, the old plot. These are buckets are what we could see potentially in the future. A signal from this time, whether with oscillons or not, would be peaked. It would be peaked related to the size of the horizon around that time. The amplitude, it turns out, is pretty relatively independent. It's about 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11. And I can tell you more about why it always turns out to be that way. There's some good physics there as well. However, of course, we don't know the energy scale of inflation. You know, we don't know where this thing actually is located. There's a mild thing I like to point out that if we don't find B modes and this curve, this is the inflationary part, shifts downwards, whereas this guy moves in the right direction, but it's towards observable frequencies. Still, you should not, this is not something I think any current observations are directly able to detect. This is too high frequency, the amplitude will be too small. But it's it would be fun if people started thinking about high frequency gravitational waves rather than just a low frequency. OK, so the rest of the talk I want to spend now on some details about the lumps that I talked about. This is inverse of the way I started on this. Uh, what are these lumps, you know, mathematically how they are, why are, how long do they live, and so on and so forth. If you took a slice within them and you looked at what they are doing, what is the field doing inside? It's just oscillating. It's going on and on and on. It's called an oscillon. It's oscillatory, spatially localized, and very long-lived. And it certainly did not discover these objects. They were called pulsons initially for very different reasons. In 1970, they were rediscovered again in a very different context uh, by Gleiser again, um, and so on. But it was always sort of one of those things that people, oh, these form in simulations, but not much, it might be not much detail analytical work had been done. By the way, just to drive this point home, this is unusual. This is what you expect to happen. In linear scalar fields, or you know, you drop a pebble on the surface of a pond, things dissipate away. They don't keep on oscillating. This is unusual. And this is because of the fact that there is nonlinearity in the potential that is opening up. There is a balancing between this thing wanting to disperse and the nonlinearity. And that is quite robust. That so just to give you some that the concrete things about, you know, I keep on saying the opening of the potential. If you write a potential like this, you know, taking away appropriate dimension, define the dimension appropriately, and these are the coefficients, then what you find is that this quantity, this relationship between lambda 4 and lambda 3, or just saying that lambda 4 is negative, for example, allows you to say that the potential opens up away from the minimum. This is, of course, only valid relatively near the minimum. But this gives you a direct way of saying, look at your model, these <coughs> objects exist in your model. I've done some slightly more baroque things. You could take a Lagrangian which non-canonical kinetic terms, so x is phi dot squared essentially, gradients included. You can also write down a condition with non-canonical kinetic terms. What this the nice thing about this is this tells you that even if you have no nonlinearity in the potential, non-canonical kinetic terms will also allow you to form these objects. Okay, so it's quite general. It's not just on linearity and the potential. One or the other will work. The work about how long these guys live, especially in the small amplitude regime, was first done by Kruskal and Seeger. It's quite a complicated analysis, but they basically showed that, that you will always have a tail of radiation. It's not perfectly stable. But that tail is exponentially small, the, ra the way the radiation goes out. It's very long lived because of that. Right? It's non perturbative. You can't do perturbative analysis to get this answer. So, if you want, I can again talk a little bit later about this. I'm going to not talk about this right now. 
There's the other question of how stable these are in the sense of if I blow on them, will they just go away? Of course, you've seen simulations already, and they seem to survive, so that's not the case. But we did some analysis on this, and we derived some conditions on when, what are the conditions on, on these objects so that when you blow on them, they don't go away. In particular, we did the analysis in the long wave regime where we, the perturbations, the most dangerous things were perturbations that were comparable to the size of the object. This is the amplitude. This is a derivative with respect to this integral. Uh, if you want, you can think. If this was a complex field, this would be like a phi star phi. This is the number of quantum entities, if you want. If you do that analysis, you can certain models. You can draw this curve. So this curve. You can think of this axis as the energy. This axis as the amplitude. In many cases, the amplitude changes. This derivative changes sign. And what we were able to show, this was with a graduate student in the Applied Math Department, David Shurkoff at MIT. We were able to show that the stability changes from this region to this. And the reason a lot of work in the past, people have not paid attention to these objects, or they were, because in three dimensions, small amplitude objects were actually unstable, and people are finding them going away. So they would always sort of like, oh, this is not interesting. But if you actually did the analysis carefully, you would find out there is a regime that these things survive, and they're stable. And you see this in simulations as well. This part of the curve is dependent on dimension. So even though they are unstable in 3D, when you go to 1D, this curve continues on to the origin. So they're all stable, even small amplitude ones. In one, in 2 plus 1D, it's flat. So it's marginally stable. In 3 plus 1D, small amplitude ones are continue stable. Just to sort of bang their chest and say my chest and say we did it right, here is the analytic calculation of the width versus the core density of these objects. These plots are taken directly from simulations of where these points end up being. It's just points taken from simulations. And you see very nicely that it, first of all, lies on this analytic curve. Uh, yes, it's kind of odd that it turns back a little bit. Right? Yes, so this is the part which is unstable. So these things kind of go away. It looks like it's moving, but it's really the points are going away. And you're left with things on this this region. So it's quite cool. This works pretty well, and we are happy that you know, this is analysis. If you're interested, this analysis that we did uh, was it turned out that it can be mapped directly to the stability of laser beam profiles in a saturated prop propagating in a saturated medium, whether they pinch or not. That's it's the same stability analysis that that applies here. So it was quite fun to be able to actually say, as done before, and apply it here. OK, how much time do I have? Um, <coughs> 10 minutes. 10 minutes? OK. Let me talk a little bit about interactions of these objects. Uh, before you move on, can I, so what could the lifetimes be? So these lifetimes for the, this is an empirical statement <coughs> I'm going to make, because I don't have, for the large amplitude ones, I have no analytic theory that predicts it. For small amplitude ones, there is a theory, but large amplitude ones, which we saw in simulations, I don't have any because they are easily 10 to 100,000 times the oscillations. Or they last for 100,000 times the oscillations. Whatever you bring the mass to be, it's 100,000 times, 10 to 100,000 times. At least, they can survive. So I, I gather that could be many Hubble times, depending on the mass scale. Exactly, exactly. exactly. So that is, at the end of the inflation, that could be many Hubble times. So that's why I'm saying you just have to be relevant to that. However, that many Hubble times is not the Hubble time today. Okay, because, so they're not, I wouldn't think of these as dark matter candidates. They could form an axion, that's a different statement. But just these blobs by themselves yeah. wouldn't survive. I mean, if they eventually decay, they'll add entropy. That's right. So they'll do dilution later than you would have in sort of normal, exactly. normal inflation. Exactly. exactly. That's exactly right. OK, so let me look at just. The social life of these guys in the sense that what happens when they collide with each other, what happens when they talk to each other. The first one is just a collision at relatively low velocity, extremely complicated, no hope of doing anything analytically. <laughs> okay. In fact, this is still relatively fast. If you actually do them slowly, fun things happen. You can produce baby oscillon and all sorts of things. It's just hard. Yeah, you can change the phase of these things, and it's really complicated. Indeed, this was actually done by an undergraduate at, at MIT at that time. And you know, basically, the project I've given them was you know, trying to find the rules of interaction with these guys. What happened? Throw them at each other. I had the code ready. And he had to just figure out, is there something simple that happened? And 
in the SOA velocity regime, nothing simple was emerging. It was just complicated. However, if you throw them at each other at very high speeds, things become very simple. Right? They just pass through each other. Okay? So one is stationary, one is just moving through. The reason it's oscillating is because this is an oscillatory function. If you Lorentz boost, the time and space parts mix with each other. So that's why you see these high oscillations. But so that's nice. Right? That things at least are simple in the high speed limit. But this allows me to tell you a little bit about this work. So here is sort of a slightly more easily visible view. So this is a one of them has been flown at relatively high velocity to the other. You see that when they come with each other, they're shaking hands, and then they move <coughs> away. And the one in the middle, so the black line is what you would have if there was no interaction. The orange line is what you have with the interaction. And you notice, I don't know if you guys can see, that it shifts a little bit in position compared to this. And also, there is a phase shift in terms of its oscillation. <coughs> right? So two things happen. This can actually be calculated analytically. And the reason we were able to do this is because of what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so this is that's my tangential digression that I promised. I'll be quick with this. So here, this let's move step away from these oscillons, these particular solitons that I'm talking about, and talk about solitons slightly broadly. The one I'm talking about here is actually a kink. So if you don't know about it, it's OK. It's just some localized lump of energy density that is stable. This is the energy density of that kink. It's sitting here, it's sitting here. I'm going to throw something at it. The top part, as before, will be at slow velocities. Messy again. Okay. Don't, these are not, this is not, if you know about this, these are not sine coordinate solitons here. They don't have, you know, they don't just pass through each other. However, now look at the same collision at very high velocities. Again, same behavior. Very simple at high velocity. So we ran with this idea, and actually, did a lot of work in trying to calculate the perturbations. Because it looks simple, you can think of doing some perturbation theory trying to understand what's going on. So we did some perturbation theory with this. The essential idea was that when you throw something very moving very fast at this object, it has Lorentz contracted. We'll use that this fact in our analysis. So what we did is the following. If you were a space-time bird, and you were, had a bird's eye view of this, <laughs> you have a Object sitting here, here is this object coming and hitting it, moving on. From the top, this is time, this is space. Here is the region occupied by the stationary one. Here is the region occupied by the moving one. This is the region of overlap. And if you just do the geometry, you will find that the interaction area is suppressed by 1 over gamma, where gamma is incoming velocity. So as gamma goes to infinity, this interaction area is pinched, goes to 0. So you can think of using this as a, as a perturbation parameter. And so we ran with that, and you know, the perturbation series tried to calculate interactions. In particular, we applied it to kinks in periodic potentials. There is one kink coming and hitting the other. Again, black line is without the interaction. The orange line is what you get with the full simulation. There is, as again, we can see a shift, phase shift. We were able to calculate this phase shift in this form. We find also that the velocity shift is 0 at leading order. By the way, this I've, I can't do this justice right now, but I think this is a pretty amazing thing. I mean, we we're really excited by this. Why are we excited by this? It's because this formula only relies on the potential itself in the Lagrangian. You don't even have to solve for the field profile, even the soliton itself. It's just an integral over the potential. And if you stare at it enough, you see that this is like an interaction. It's, you know, what is, comes from just taking the sum minus the potential of the sum. The sum of the potential minus the potential. These square roots just come from, from coordinate transformations. They're not actually uh, that interesting, even though they seem so. This delta phi is just a difference between one minimum and the other. Right? So it's just how you go from one minimum to the other. So everything is determined here. It's valid for non-integrable systems. So you don't have to just be around some integrable system. You can go arbitrarily far from them. It's fine. Periodic potentials. There's no velocity change to leading order. It doesn't depend on whether you have kinks or anti kinks. Again, words that don't make sense if you haven't thought about this, probably. We checked, of course, whether our results were good. Uh, and you can see that the curve, this is as a function, the phase shift as a function of gamma. You can see that the these data points are simulations. The orange curve is our 
calculation. Works pretty well. Even better, we actually change this model with a parameter here. Epsilon equals 0 is the known case applies here. We allow this epsilon to vary quite a bit. And again, you see that the curves and the dots line up. So I think we have some really good confidence that this works. For the f this is not appreciated in literature, but you can the shift of how these objects shift once they interact, where they always move forward or backwards. People always thought it was one way. It's not. You can actually get them moving either way. You can hit attractive or repulsive. The core is concave potential. Uh, no, it's uh, it happens when the potential sort of is much shallow. Yeah, the, yeah, it's the shallowness of the potential. But it's not exact. I mean, yes, we tried to come up with a, you know, you can just say that, OK, when this becomes, yeah. then it goes becomes negative, but that's not saying anything. I tried to come up with some argument, but I haven't been able to say precisely what the same thing is. It would be nice to have it. OK, so the important thing to, that I want to say is that this is nice for people doing simulations as well, because simulations become very difficult when you go to high velocities. This is precisely where our method works best. OK. I actually don't think I have time to talk about another thing I wanted to say about phase transition in the other universe and how you can create spectral distortions of the CMB based on that. But if you have questions, please ask me. This is quite fun. This is work in progress, um, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. It's fun stuff. So let me end the digression and just start with the summary. So what, I, what have I told you about these blobs? Yeah, I've told you that at the end of inflation, in a potential that looks like this, as long as this scale m where the potential changes shape is small compared to the Planck scale, you'll have resonant growth of fluctuations, which will go and collapse into these blobs. And implications of this, I don't have something we can see in the sky yet, but there are things that we can think about. Bottleneck for reheating being one of them. Um, I also told you a little bit about the conditions for these objects. This is a condition for the emergence. This is a condition for the existence. This is a condition for the stability. And I told you about their interactions at least at high velocities. Uh, quick thanks to a bunch of collaborators. Uh, Daniel, I haven't talked about that. That's about the spectral distortions. It's not done uh, yet. Hopefully, it will be done soon. Also, thanks to some undergraduates who helped with the simulations and so on. Uh, Fun work. And some, I spend about 50% or 40% of my time nowadays working about in the late universe. This was all about the early universe, if you're interested in dark energy like things. Also, a recent paper on gravitational lensing from with the Fermi collaboration. Please ask me about it tonight. We can talk about it. All right. Thank you. It is kind of interesting that you can get these to be metastable from many Hubble tasks, for example. So, uh, and there, I gather there's significant energy for energy density. For yes, that's right. So, um, I don't know how many of these you have for horizon volume, but those are big perturbations, and you've got a long time if it's many, many Hubble times. So you'll get peculiar velocities in these relative to the Hubble yes. flow. Yes. So you will get collisions of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Have you looked at that at all? Uh, I haven't looked at that, but I did try to estimate uh, whether you know it's basically. The problem can almost entirely be reduced to just thinking of dark matter in an expanding universe, in the late universe. If you have a bunch of these guys around, it's a matter dominant universe, you can think of these as particles, and you can ask what happens under gravitational instability. And they indeed should come together uh, a little bit. But what I do find is that collisions, while they will happen, not many of them can. I can't think of many interactions happening simply because there'll be some angular momentum that they fall in. But just like in today's universe, you, know, you get halos forming. They don't just stick. Not many dark matter particles see each other. Uh, so in the same way, I would suspect that you would get halos first, and then maybe there will be some collisions between them. And what happens after the collisions, I have no idea. So just statistically, how many of them will stick to form bigger things or smaller things? In fact, those collisions are not happening in the ultra relative secret regime that I was talking about, where it's simple. There, things are complicated, and I have no answer to the question. Whether they will stick and form a bigger object, and then maybe you will form some black holes, because many things stick together or not, that I just don't know. So I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I mean, but I mean, effectively, you're matter dominated. Yeah, absolutely. Which is amazing at very high temperature. Yeah. So 
if I just look at that, I mean, I could say it this way in astrophysical language, the genes mass actually is much smaller than the yeah, causal horizon yeah. mass now. So it's, you know, it meets the sort of zero order criteria of flexibility. Right. No, absolutely. So there is gravitational instability that should be there at that time. Now, people have actually, so this is not, I should say that even if you did not have these blobs, if you just had a matter dominated universe with scale flow, it's still the same as a matter dominated universe. So you still have gravitational instability, and people have looked at this. And there are, if you have a long enough period, you can grow fluctuations significantly. So you have structures forming, just like today, uh, in the early universe. But eventually, the problem is that you have, you have to make the universe thermal. <laughs> you have to. Ooh. Oh, there's power. Sorry. I, I pressed something. This was a <laughs> simulation of parametric resonance. <laughs> An actual experiment. Uh, sorry, I <laughs> sorry, I pressed something up. So you can see how quickly uh, the arc of the swing increases. And she was not harmed in the doing of the experiment. Yes. So if you have a two-component input arm or something, can you generate internal angular Yes. So there are. So you're talking about that there's some spin-off, some motion along this direction, uh, and have stable objects forming because of that. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, complex scalar fields. If you had a complex scalar field as in you could think of it. There's some angular motion. But I'm saying you are not linear, isn't stuff. Can you start generating such objects with internal motion? Just by the same amount of parametric progressions and stuff? I, I would imagine yes. Uh, but I don't have good intuition about multi field objects if formed this way, whether they are stable or not. Those are cue balls. Yeah, so the cue balls, right. So. Can make it, you can generate. Oh, yeah, so cue balls, sorry. So, if you're, so that's what I was talking about. The cue balls, yes, you can definitely generate uh, from this parametric instability, and you would form them easily in the early universe if you want. After inflation, if you could build up a model with this, you would generate lots of cue balls, and they would dominate the energy. So that's not something. <laughs> what is going on? What other movies do you have? <laughs> <laughs> OK. What is this one? Uh, <laughs> yeah, what's, what's this one? <laughs> It's a movie of layers of sand being oscillated. This is actually a nature paper. You see these, it's hard to see because it's not dark enough. You see these cavities moving up and down. These are, they call them oscillons. I can't mathematically show that they're exactly equivalent because these are grains of sand, and grains of sand are much harder than crazy stuff in the other universe. Uh, this is drip. This is drip. But you still, the oscillating field still forms localized structures that are quite stable, that stay on for a while, and they're the same oscillating period. Oh, sorry. Now, so what do I go look to observe to test any of this? Uh, good question. If I had the answer, I'd be, I would have given the talk exactly on that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know yet. Okay, so I think the way to see this, that right now I'm more interested in just doing the forward calculation. It's seeing what, what actually happens if they're so dominant. Once I have confidence in these other things that happen, then I can look at everything. So one example would be if these kinds of things, say, happen in axions. The axions also scale a field, say, they happen much later in the history of the universe. You could produce inhomogeneous perturbations in the axion field that may localize for a while. And this could affect the principle, I don't know the number, big bang nucleosynthesis because it would be inhomogeneous. That's one thing that could happen. Uh, in terms of this very early universe thing, if you had a fantastic detector gravitational wave generation, the shape of the spectrum there actually holds some information about these objects. There are peaks and troughs in there. But again, this is very futuristic. Uh, I don't think we have any experiments currently that can look at this. The other thing you could think about doing is this. This, I wouldn't say it's a proof of this process happening, but at least it's something that it, because it changes the expansion history, if you know what model, of, if you have a model of inflation, this changes the expansion of history, so it will change the inference of the model parameters of, the, of, of what you infer. So that's another way of saying that. If you believe, there's a good reason to believe in the inflationary model, then this would, you would have to take something like this into account to know what, uh, what model parameters you have. <coughs> yes? Should, should I be surprised that the, the oscillons for the rest? The, I mean, it, the thing that picks the rest room is the frame the rest room where the field is uniform. Right. I mean, you should. They, go all over. they do initially. They go all over, but expansion. They're heavy things. The momentum, their their total momentum damps very quickly because of expansion. I don't have gravity because of the expansion. Because of the expansion, they're just going to become 
So if you do this without expansion, you will see them running all the time. Okay, there's no, there's no, nothing that prevents them. But because of the expansion, they basically become rocks sitting there. Only when you turn on gravity, okay, local gravity, because they start moving again because of gravitational interactions. I really enjoyed that. It's really cool. Uh, so if you want to talk to somebody about big bang nuclear synthesis and uh, yeah. No, absolutely. But I, you know, of course, they've got a student uh, who's working on things related to this. And, uh, yeah. Uh, later, we'll be to two of them, actually. And they're both still at the UCLA. Don't have so I don't know how long you around. Oh, OK. We'll miss you. But, uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs>